I want to uh, go, just go up and check out the things before we get started. I just want to check the height of the podium and stuff again because because I'm a stander. I can walk well, you can around. Walk around. You just have to remember it's not to fall track. off. Right. She's like the rock star of nursing. I know. <laughs> Just, yeah, yeah, we're taking pictures this way. And I'll put this in my collection. Loretta, we can't let go of you. <laughs> I wouldn't be here without her, and without her vision, and without her mentorship. Three times. One more. Okay. <laughs> oh, Lord. You didn't take okay. the wrinkles out. <laughs> Dr. Loretta Ford really was up against a lot of resistance from both nursing and medicine. She didn't let anybody foil her. She really has transformed healthcare and nursing um, and nursing education. You know, she was just it. She was the it girl. <laughs> I would love to hear about how, you know, where that wild idea came from. I grew up in a very large family uh, where we all were, I think, a, a bunch of tigers on the street and got along well at home, one of those things. My dad was a, an Austrian immigrant. My mother was Irish, grew up in, in New York. That combination of, of Austrian-Irish has an edge. You can hear that coming out, and I can hear my father, who was a very determined Prussian general, and so we were highly disciplined, but we also uh, had all the, the love and attention that an Irish mother would give you. I was born in 1920. I think I was the last one born in the Bronx. So after that, we left for northern New Jersey, and we did because of the, of the Depression and the job situation. I grew up in the Great Depression. You think we had a Depression recently? <laughs> no way. You know, I've been there and done that in a way that I think toughened me and uh, gave me the values that I have. First of all, for frugality. You wasted nothing. And uh, also to save and to take care of myself. I did get into trouble in school occasionally because I couldn't wait to, to answer, you know, I, I, I could jump up and I, I, it would seem, the rest of it seemed so slow, you know, I wanted to, so the teacher would have to <laughs> settle me down a little bit and say, we're going to do this by raising your hand when you want to speak, please. And she was talking to me, of course. Hi. <laughs> I don't want to keep you from uh, no, talking. Out. <laughs> <laughs> so we have about 105 now, uh -huh. uh, which is huge. Over time, the findings seem to be that um, they're causing some brittleness of bone. They did see that with um, some of the Fosamax that patients... That she is so up to date on everything that is occurring, and she takes in all this information, synthesizes it, and then uses it in a witty format that makes her point. The American Heart Association and the American A great uncle who happened to live with us uh, uh, named me Dolly. So I am Dolly to all my family, my friends. But when I left to go to, into nursing, I thought, oh, goodness, are you Nurse Dolly? Yeah, that's a kid's name. I didn't like the name Loretta, so I just, when I left home, I just told everybody my name was Lee. I went to the uh, nursing school at New Brunswick Hospital, Middlesex General. And I remember that my father had to borrow $100 to pay the tuition for me to attend. I was too young, so I was a nurse's aide for uh, 18 months before I could enter the school of nursing. I loved maternal and child health. I loved surgical nursing. Every service I rotated in, I was in love with. I just knew that I was going to go into that as a specialty. You know, the police chief said when I left town, you'll be back. Nursing is a very hard and arduous profession. And of course, that was a challenge. There was no way I was going to 
I was going to go back to my small town and be a failure at nursing. I spent a year at the visiting nurse service in New Brunswick. One of the um, supervisors there at the visiting nurse service, she kept telling me that, you know, there's more to nursing and there's more to learning. Really, what she was talking about was being educated as a professional. She had a baccalaureate degree, I remember that, and I was thinking, she's really up in the world, you know. I went to the Army Air Force in 1943. A man that I was engaged to was killed, and so I was really, really felt called by that, you know, this is time to go. I had a great time. <laughs> That's the best way to spend a war. We had a hospital on the beach. We had some marvelous experiences there. When I was discharged, I went to the University of Colorado. At that time, they had a public health nursing certificate as well as a baccalaureate, and Colorado offered that. And that was one of the better choices that I made in my life to go there. And I thought the baccalaureate was the end in itself, right? Think again. I was there about mm, five or six weeks, I guess, maybe less. And we were, we went bowling. I know, remember, it was snowing. Of course, I thought that was unusual to be snowing in, in October. Uh, but we were walking back from the bowling alley. And that's when Bill and his buddy, <laughs> Butch, <laughs> came by in this flamboyant Ford with a sandstone and yellow decorations on it. So it was a pretty wild looking car. The girls, we were girls then, we looked at each other and said, ah, why not? We can take care of these guys. Bill wanted to get married. I said, no way. First of all, my degree. I had to have education. Very very important, most important thing. And secondly, if this doesn't work out, I'm putting 250 bucks in the bank, and believe me, I'm out of here. <laughs> That's no way to start a marriage, maybe. Because I don't know what happened to the $250. Do you ever remember that, dear? I don't know. <laughs> and they got all the tags? Oh, good. So I got her. Thank you for getting the tan. Did you meet my daughter? I, you know, grew up in Boulder. My dad is a home builder and built our house on Fifth Street. And so I, I lived there till I went to college, actually. It took a long time to realize, you know, that she was like a movie star kind of scenario, I guess. You know, you realize what she did, but you didn't realize to what extent the appreciation for all that she had done till later, you know. When did it hit you? Oh, let's see, it was about 10 minutes ago <laughs> when you started interviewing me. <laughs> These were very formative years for me at CU. It was at the university that I became um, really professionalized in terms of my career. And I got my master's in public health nursing. Dean Lockman was the dean at that time, a very powerful woman in nursing circles. She was very instrumental in my going on for a doctorate. She called me uh, up one day and said, come up and see me. She said to me, here, fill this out. I said, what is it? She said, that's an application for graduate school. I said, graduate school? She said, yes, it's time you went for your doctorate. <laughs> I said, I went for my doctorate? She said, yes, there's a fellowship, uh, and uh, I want you to apply for that fellowship. Oh, I said, that's a funny one, yeah. I said, okay. I didn't argue with Dean Locker and you just did it. Well, lo and behold, in March, I received this fellowship. I had a lot of support for it. Not that families always think you should keep going to school once you get married. I mean, they sort of expect you to do something different. Not my family, but I think Bill's family, essentially sort of wondered why. And even the kids on the block, when Valerie got a little older, you know, they thought she, she had a slow mother who, who had to keep going to school. I was working on my doctorate, and I was taking advanced, advanced, advanced statistics. And it was driving me up the wall. So I came home to the university one day, and I said, I'm quitting. 
I said, this is enough. I'm too stupid to get a doctor's degree. I'm just stupid, stupid, stupid. I'm not, I can't do it. He said, oh, you can do it? He said, a lot of stupid people have doctor's degrees. <laughs> remind you that the, the nurse practitioner roots are in public health nursing practice and we uh, we are jokingly referred to our, uh, to our mission which I think came out of the Christian review is that public health nurses were supposed to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable <laughs> We were the Lone Rangers in county nursing in the West, and we were it. We're, we were the first independent practitioners in nursing. My practice in public health nursing really convinced me that we, we needed to be able to make decisions clinically. Because when you would call a physician about a patient, you chose your language very carefully hmm? to be sure that you didn't diagnose anything. Let's see what I used to say about that. Public health nursing. Public health nursing is a combination of professional nursing and public health nursing practiced clandestinely to make the physician think he was the law of health. <laughs> she was beginning very early to see the potential of nursing to talk about what nursing could do for the underserved, the displaced, all the things that you think of that became the. I was on the committee to, to recommend a new dean with Henry Kemp. You know, Henry Kemp, of course, was the chief of pediatrics. He had identified the battered child syndrome. And Henry Kemp said to me, my colleague, Henry Silva, has been, uh, he knew I was working on the family nurse practitioner. He said, my colleague, Henry Silva, would be interested in talking with you. This was a 64 year before we started. Henry Silva bought his marvelous teaching skills and his, his knowledge of growth and development in children and his, his great interest in children and wellness in a sense. Well, we developed a curriculum with the students. We said there are things, you know, we had a general idea about assessment and all that kind of stuff. But the students were very experienced public health nurses. Some of them had been overseas. Some had master's degrees. We insisted that they be academically qualified and academically qualified for graduate school. It was in January of... Uh... 66 that I joined the program. Well, the curriculum was a whole series of specialty areas in pediatrics that we delved into in, in detail. And we did that by going to the department heads, <laughs> I mean, these experts in the field, and sitting down and going over the curriculum and going over the content with them. And it was a wonderful experience. The power that Henry Kemp had as the chief of pediatrics and Henry Silva was considerable at that time. So when they would ask, you know, specialists in the medical center to talk to these nurses, there was no question about it, they would do that. Henry Silva was a marvelous teacher, by the way, and I'd learned a great deal from him. And he always started with saying, a mother comes in, a mother comes in, and then we start. What we were doing was teaching the nursing process in depth. It was teaching them to feel more, to see more, to smell more, to touch more, you know, oscillation, palpation, right? And that's all we were teaching them. It wasn't any different. The kids weren't any different than we were, but we were looking at them in a different way when we had to come up with a decision. We had the four months at the university, and then we had to go out to the health station or, or to our clinical practice site. It was an isolated little health station in the housing project. We were, of course, linked in with the Denver Visiting Nurse Service, 
and they had a, an entire system of well baby clinics. So we were hooked in with them, although we were a little different because we were there all the time and we were seeing sick children, you know, children with minor illnesses as well as well. I didn't think we were involved in great change because I thought I was doing exactly what the profession said the profession wanted. What did the profession want? It wanted independence, autonomy, teamwork, self-empowerment of patients. It wanted a health and wellness orientation. I mean, these are all prevention. These were all things that the nursing profession was saying it wanted. So I and Henry built the model of the nurse practitioner on that basis. To this day, I still remember that the persons who were the, the per, perhaps naysayers were not the other professions. They were the nurses. Leaders in nursing at that time had a different agenda. And they had come up, they had come up trying to get away from medicine. And they had done very well. They had come into the universities, they had established all nursing faculties, but it had been it had been like fifteen years struggle to do this. And they had a strong identity with ind the independence of nursing. And so this thing of nurse practitioner, where we had to um, confer with doctors, help have them help us with our curriculum, uh, have us help us learn things, that they just thought that was a throwback to the old days and they wanted no part of it. It was not easy in those days. We were not always accepted by faculty and that's why the nursing programs ended up as not baccalaureate or master's degree programs. It was a great learning period because I learned a lot and I learned a lot about change which I found much easier when I was a lone practitioner than I was, I was a faculty member. But, um, and it, it, was, it was very hard uh, for a long while there. Yeah. And I invested a great deal in it. And the only thing, there are several things that saved me. First of all, we began to write. We wrote the description of the program. We published that, Henry Silver and I did. I went around and spoke. The enthusiastic reception was wonderful. I was a beginning nurse practitioner in the early 70s. So I was a PNP. And this was a time when we really needed to look at evidence-based practice. We were looking at data. We, and she was writing everything. So I think I read everything that Dr. Ford wrote. Just before I went off to graduate school, I was looking through a Time magazine. And I saw in the Time magazine a picture and a story about a lady by the name of Sue Sterling. And Sue turned out to be the first pediatric nurse practitioner in the U.S. And it was describing the kind of work she was doing in rural Colorado. Lee, of course, was revered by all of us who became nurse practitioners in those early days. And because Lee had founded the program, she thought it was only appropriate that she go back through it as a student herself. And I was in that class of 10 students with Loretta Ford going through the nurse practitioner program. Um, and I am not easily intimidated, but um, I really was pretty overwhelmed. Oh, I should have been more. And I will never forget the first party we had, a little party of 10 people in my dicky little air, unair-conditioned apartment on South Pole Street. And we came to the party. And we all brought, had appetizers, chips and dip. I think we had some Lancers or the two swine or something like that. And we showed up with smoked oysters. <laughs> smart woman who showed up with her smoked oysters and sat right down and partied like crazy. <laughs> and um, that's when I found out that Loretta Ford was just more than human. And, uh, she still is. <laughs> Rochester came along and it was, it was not the, um, the best relocation in the world from Colorado. 
and it was a long shot that they took and that I took, because we went there. I said, well, I'll come and give a lecture, but I'm not really interested. Um, so I did, I did a lecture on uh, the nurse practitioner, I think, at the time. And then um, they wanted us to come back. I said, look, we're not interested and in, you know, and well, we want you to bring your husband. And what, so we went to Rochester in, I think it was February or March or something like that. It was a terrible time of year. When we came out of there, Bill said, there's no way we're going to move here. I don't think I can do it. <laughs> so we, and then I went back again myself. And I saw something in the system there that provided us with an opportunity to demonstrate the, the role of professional nursing in an institutional setting. Because I would be the director of nursing of an 800-bed hospital and the dean of the School of Nursing. I didn't know how to do this, but I thought the control and power over that system would be of of great strength in terms in terms of trying out a really professional nursing system. So I was going off on a trip and I said to Bill, I know you're not interested in going to Rochester, but why don't you think about it? I think it would be a great opportunity career-wise for me. So he thought it over. So when the university called and I was out of town, Bill, t Bill told him, we're coming. <laughs> which created a big bahoo at Rochester. My husband said, you could hear the provost yelling down the hall, she's coming, she's coming. I was the founding dean of the School of Nursing, because nursing was not a separate school till I went there. In 1979, we introduced the doctoral program, the PhD. <laughs> it wasn't easy. There was a lot of faculty resistance to doing that, but I felt it was time, and I believed we could, you know, get funding to help us do that, and I had the university support for it. But the resistance was on the part of the nursing faculty, who felt that we didn't have enough research, we didn't have enough faculty, we didn't have enough resources, we, whatever, whatever. Turns out that we have one of the best PhD programs in the nation. Every Saturday, I rounded in the hospital. And I talked to the nurses, I talked to the staff, I talked, I mean, to the uh, um, administrative, whoever was on administratively. I talked to the patients. I talked to the people who were cleaning the floor. I talked to everybody, uh, trying really mostly to get to listen to what they had to say in response. One time, very early in my career there, I was rounding, and this gruff surgeon, who I, I recognized, because uh, he was a very important surgeon there, and said, what do you think you're doing here, Dean Ford? I said, well, doctor, I'm doing the same thing you're doing, looking after my charges. <laughs> Lee is best known, of course, for the nurse practitioner model, but she brought to us a real breath of fresh air. Uh, she created a separate school of nursing. She also brought something she's passionate about, which is called the unification model, where you integrate research, practice, and teaching. When I went there, too, we had 400 LPNs, 400 aides, and 400 RNs. And this diagram, and the diagram was the patient was in the middle, then these aid types right around it, and then the RNs. I said, no, we have to reverse that ring. We'll put the RN close to the patient and put these others on the outside who are assistants to the nurse so she can, or he, can take care of the patient. The University of Rochester has really honored uh, Dr. Loretta Ford, and they've built an entire wing for her. I will say that a teaching in that building, now that we have the Loretta C. Ford Education Wing, is a whole new world. She was instrumental right at just the right time to get that wing going. This is the groundbreaking Loretta C. Ford Educational Wing at the University of Rochester. 
My inaugural address was based on the theme, A New Order of Things. And um, so when I left, the faculty all embroidered this for me and put the new order of things uh, as the theme, uh, which was really very nice. Well, these are memorabilia from uh, many uh, organizations for the, some of the work that I've done, mostly in nurse practitioning, but some other things. This tray was uh, it's a beautiful um, leather-backed uh, ceramic tray that was given to me by Canadian nurses many years ago when I first spoke in, in Canada. Uh, this is uh, by the Institute of Medicine um, Gustav Leinhardt Award. It's a, it's a medallion. Hmm. This one a very interesting award from the uh, University of Tennessee. Um, it's, a, it's a globe. I have spoken in, in many places, many states, and foreign countries, too, uh, to China. Uh, I did teach in Japan, was in Japan for three months, which was a delightful experience. I taught in Australia and New Zealand. Went to Europe, went to the Soviet Union twice. I didn't do any work in Africa, but I did visit. This is the Elizabeth um, Blackwell Award. Elizabeth Blackwell uh, was the first physician, woman physician, trained in the university in the U.S. And this little statue is of, of Elizabeth Blackwell. This is a lovely quilt that was presented to me at the Keystone Conference. The patches were all created by many of my former students, uh, some of the faculty at, at Colorado, um, and others who wanted to honor me. What's with the superwoman? Oh, well, that came out of a Keystone conference. I've used that super nurse costume quite frequently <laughs> to uh, uh, just have fun on podiums. The funniest thing is when Lee dressed up as super nurse, there comes Lee out on the stage and she whips off her top coat and there was this super nurse and it just epitomizes her and it was it was beautiful it's very fitting because she's a powerhouse oh, thank you so wow. much for making my life so fun <laughs> no honest you, you were a wonder life. i know but i'm so glad you were the one to break the path How's that? <laughs> thank you for everything i get a lot of credit but you guys do but you took a lot of shots <laughs> and i'm glad you gave a few back <laughs> i'm sure i could be a physician's assistant I'm sure I could be an accountant. I could be a chicken rancher. I'm a nurse practitioner and I love what I do. And I've, you know, I've got the opportunity to be who I am and do what I do and provide the kind of autonomous care that I do because Loretta Ford didn't know what a box was. Must be getting old, I'm sitting around. <laughs> Ever since I've known her, which has now been 30 years, oh my goodness, um, she's predicted it accurately. When she said she worries about, it was true. When she says she thinks it will happen, it did. She does have a tremendous amount to say to this day. Something or other. Well, you look absolutely fantastic. Oh, well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Hi. It was nice to meet you. I hope and your eyes aren't going bad. <laughs> <laughs> and it was nice of you to come. Oh, well, I always thank you. About you. It's so honored to meet you. Oh, wow. Well, so I'm glad you Tell me about you. I'm a nurse practitioner from Michigan. Uh huh. She and her husband and I were sitting down having um, a light dinner, and we were talking. And I had not yet gone back for my doctorate. And she said, Marilyn, you need to go back and get your doctorate, and don't mess around. Don't waste time. Just get it done. And I did. She said, what, what area are you going into? And I said, administration. She said, no. She said, you need to be in education. She said, you've got too much to be in administration. She says, you're going to change. I said, oh, OK. But well, okay. I will look it up on the web. On the yeah, website. if you can't find it, t contact me and okay. I'll, I'll let you know the citation and where to get it. I don't think there's ever been a letter written or an email sent to her that she's not ever quickly responded to. I said, you know what? 
Dr. Loretta Ford had really given me the kick I needed <laughs> <laughs> to go into teaching. Well, good. Yes. So I thank you for that. Well, I want you to keep in touch and tell me how you're doing, huh? This is one of my students. Oh, how do you this do? Is, you're Mary? Yes, well, she, she goes by it. Yeah. I'll, go, I'll, I'll go by Mary for you, though. She, oh, absolutely. Right. And she yeah. had to meet the lady. Yes. Oh, wow. Well, nice to meet you. I've been a nurse you. practitioner for two and a half years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the best hug I had in a long time. <laughs> now tell me what Hi, your family practice is. Yes, ma'am. What are you doing these days? Um, I'm working at the Colorado Center for Nursing Excellence, and I'm doing leadership training for nurses. Are you? Throughout the state. And I, I did get the doctorate of nursing practice you a do. couple years Wonderful. ago, right before I retired. With the help of her and, and her image and her, her tenacity to move this role through, and her appeal to people and nursing throughout the world, it, this has to be one of her greatest legacies to nursing that it's not only in the United States, but it's now very much international. It is moving to Southeast Asia. It is moving to South Africa. It is moving around the world. I am ever so blessed to have met her and to be able to have communication with the first person who ever gave us hope as nurse practitioners. I do want to summarize uh, my 44, 45 years as a nurse practitioner. I have been kicked and kissed. I have been reviled and revered. I have been credited and crucified. But I haven't been Botoxed or detoxed. <laughs> and I am will ever see for what and I approve this message. I always think about what Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small, committed, thoughtful group of citizens can change the world because it's the only thing that ever has changed the world. We're gonna dance.